I'd like to kick off uh, our first round on risk reduction by introducing our introducer, Ben Jeffs. I'll say that all of the bios are included in your programs, so we are not gonna go at length in introducing people. If you would like to read more about Ben Jeffs, I invite you to have a look at the program. Um, meanwhile, Ben Jeffs, Program Director of the World Monuments Institute at the World Monuments Fund, will be our first speaker. Thank you, Corey, for that introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank Corey and the PI team for getting us all together here and um, organizing this fantastic opportunity in this beautiful auditorium um, for us to get together and talk. Um, I'm delighted to have the honor of introducing the very first panel. Uh, we've got an amazing group of presenters uh, in this session, all looking at different aspects of ri risk reduction and how that relates to managing heritage impact from disaster. Uh, speaking first is a bit of a double-edged sword, I think. There's lots of unclaimed, unclaimed territory to talk about broad themes, but also lots of time for counter-arguments to develop, uh, and I hope you'll be gentle with those. Um, anyway, this, this panel's topic, risk reduction, raises some fascinating ideas. I think it's a, an amazing place to start. Um, ideally, we want to try and avoid disasters and, and the impact that, that flow from those and identifying risks and reducing those is, is the start to that. Um, I think one of the, the, the kind of key, one of the first key um, questions that's, that's most important in, in identifying risk and identifying exactly the nature of that risk, I think that's at the heart of our discussions about emergency response and at the heart of some wider issues in heritage management. Uh, as Apana will point out in her paper uh, later on, one of the particular issues with identifying risks to heritage in common with risk management in other culturally focused fields is the definition of exactly what assets we're trying to protect. Our concept of heritage has evolved considerably over the last 50 years. We've recognized that what we value is not just a collection of physical sites and objects. It's an intricate network of intangible, tangible, portable and immovable assets behaviors, beliefs, places, buried archaeology, ancient monuments and museum objects create a pattern of significance that varies with the viewpoint of the observer and, and changes across time. It's this, it's this particular pattern that's valuable um, and not each individual element. They're, they're merely components of, a, of an intrinsic whole. This concept is really relevant here because the success of past risk management programs, when they've been tested by disaster, has varied wildly, mostly according to the particular section of the broad church of heritage that they're aiming to protect. The greatest successes and the greatest focus has been in mitigating the physical threats to physical structures and objects. Understandably so, they're visible and tangible and they're often managed by organizations that have a specific mandate for their protection. These successes are important, but the worrying thing is that their focus on purely physical damage separates those assets from their context, and it frames our understanding of risk and emergency in very physical terms, looking at very physical things. Terry's going to talk uh, shortly about Disaster is a social construct. And I wanted to hint at that with a, a recent example that I think illustrates our understanding of risks as drivers of, of visible physical losses. The recent damage in Syria is obvious and something I'm sure that we'd all define as a disaster. But my question is, perhaps we wouldn't respond in exactly the same way if the immediate physical damage wasn't present. The displacement of millions of Syrians from their homes has removed social context from many of these sites. Stories, musical traditions, craft skills, memories, family ties, generations of management experience and connection have been dispersed, perhaps lost for good. This has massively dis diminished the significance of the sites that we're talking about without any physical damage. It's removed their use, their function, um, 
and as, and as a result of that, it's, it's threatened their long-term survival. It's destroyed the very things which can be important in helping communities to recover from disaster and to reduce their vulnerability to future losses. Yet, I doubt we would have responded as vehemently, either after the event or as part of a disaster planning process without the immediate physical damage. One of the most complex and interesting challenges we have in assessing and managing risks in the heritage sphere, I think is, is to understand and to manage this intangible glue that links society and heritage together. All of that's not to suggest that the directly physical interventions to prevent damage to physical sites and objects aren't a vital part of what we do. I think it's likely that they're always going to form the backbone of, of heritage protection work because they're incredibly tangible. Um, but, and, and this work, particularly in collections management sector, has moved on hugely in the last decade. The nature of collections is largely tangible and often movable, opens up an abundance of options, which are reflected in very successful programs. At the other end of the spectrum, we're dealing with landscapes of immovable heritage. The hazards they face are similar, though the scale of any interventions or planning requires collaboration and resources on national and international levels, far greater collaboration and far greater planning than is necessary, for example, in a historic house setting or a museum to protect collections. Um, there have been real notable successes in dealing with this end of the scale, particularly at a theoretical level. We understand the potential range of physical risks that immovable heritage faces extremely well, and we've developed some useful physical strategies for decreasing the vulnerability of sites. The recent earthquake in Nepal is a case in point. Uh, I think Kamal Ariel will talk more perhaps on Thursday about the aftermath and the amazing community efforts to recover from the devastation. I wanted to just touch on the risk management work that Kathmandu Valley Preservation Trust has been undertaking, partly with World Monuments help over the last 10 years. They've completed preservation projects at 45 major heritage sites in the heart of the earthquake zone. When the earthquake struck this year, only three of those, those 45 sites suffered major structural damage. We need to keep working to understand and refine the risks, but the process of assessing and mitigating earthquake risk in Nepal is clearly working. And yet, huge numbers of historic structures were damaged during the same earthquake. In many cases, because of the lack of economic and physical capacity to undertake the work necessary to protect the sites, sometimes simple maintenance would have been sufficient to keep a building standing. This issue of scale is one of the greatest predictors of vulnerability. The mismatch between the potential problem and the resources needed to mitigate the loss is likely to be one of the biggest challenges we face over the coming decades, as issues like conflict, instability and changes in climate continue to threaten heritage. Identifying and prioritizing risks is likely to be even more necessary. Perhaps redefining how we identify vulnerability is key to mobilizing the amazing community networks that Laurie will talk about in her paper. The work of Terry and others to investigate how society understands and responds to heritage and disaster may be an extremely important part of this process. The last point I wanted to make before I hand over to the panelists is to reinforce the importance of engaging with the process of disaster risk management in other fields. Disaster mitigation is commanding huge investment at the moment, perhaps not enough but still huge sums. Big projects dealing with big potential impacts of change, changes in climate and conflict will become increasingly common and with big projects come associated impacts to heritage. Flood defense projects are an excellent, excellent example, essential to protect populations, but often hugely damaging to coastal heritage. As Aparna will point out, there are gaps in this engagement at present. These gaps mean we're often unable to quantify or manage the risks to heritage associated with risk management in other fields. We've made huge strides in, the understand, in understanding risks to heritage over the last few years. There are still obvious challenges, but we're developing frameworks through events like this, through our conversations over the next three days, to refine our approach. And I'm really hopeful we'll continue to make progress. Uh, I'd like to hand over now to uh, Terry Cannon. Uh, for those of you who don't know Terry, I again direct you to the, the, to the conference program. Thank you.